I'm so excited to have you here today. And I'm going to do one of those really awkward things and tell you, mm -hmm. you like changed my life. <laughs> I think it's so weird when people come up to you and okay. like, do you know what this thing happened yeah. and you changed my life? And it's, it's always kind of like super weird, but this actually happened. So when I was a student um, and you were my professor at Kansai Gaida University, I vividly remember your, or the first, um, the first lecture where you, you know, you had your slides. And the first thing I thought was, I've never seen slides like this at a university before. And then, you know, one of your first slides was, my name's Ga and it's Car with Tenten. And I just thought, oh my gosh, I've never, this is just a totally new experience for me. And then you introduced me to things like, you should read this book. It's called um, A Whole New Mind by Daniel Pink. And that was um, essentially where I found out about design thinking. And now 10 years later, 12 years later, I run a design thinking agency or an innovation mm -hmm. agency rather um, in Japan. So I couldn't be more excited to have you here. Thanks so much. Well, it's great to be here. I went all the way to my office from my bedroom. So <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, so I what I would love to talk to you about today and kind of why we decided um, and why you so kindly uh, agreed to kind of connect is we wanted to kind of really dive into that topic of storytelling. You have been an advocate um, that I can certainly personally vouch for for the last 12 years, knowing you um, of telling stories in a different way, communicating in a different way, presenting in a different way, um, you know, even much before kind of the, the, the what we know as stories today. So why don't we begin with that kind of broad definition of stories? Because when we originally thought of stories, we thought of something different. And now there's things like Instagram stories and, you know, it's taken on a whole new world of its of itself. So why don't we begin with kind of laying the foundation? Why don't you tell us a little bit about <laughs> mm. what is storytelling? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, well, there's there's been hundreds of books written on it, just on the subject of screen screenplays alone. Um, but if I had to distill it down, one aspect is that it, you know, it's something that gives us a reason to listen. I mean, every good story, whether it's a movie or a novel, it, you know, give me a reason to to care, to want to turn the page, or you know, to go to go deeper, even if there's some boring bits uh, along the way, which is sometimes inevitable. But I think that's the biggest reason. And when I uh, you know, because I've been in Japan a long time. So right mm -hmm. after college, my university experience in, in the States where I studied philosophy was great because it's small classes, it's all discussion. There isn't, I didn't really have boring lectures and PowerPoint hadn't been invented. So I, now I'm in Japan, you know, fast forward to working for Sumitomo and oh, good Lord, uh, PowerPoint <laughs> became, became popular. And where in the old days, people would use a chalkboard and then a whiteboard to kind of explain ideas which is much more like a story in the sense that, you know, there's a, again, a reason to listen, it's going step by step to suddenly just being uh, screens of information, related information, although it's not always following. It's just too much. It's just information. And it became very easy to do easy for the creator to make slides like that and presentations like that. Um, and it just became normal after a while, but it's overwhelming. And I thought it was ironic because what Japan means to me, one of the things uh, are the, you know, the Zen arts or mm -hmm. no theater or sado or ikebana or whatever, but mm -hmm. simplicity is the key. You know, rakugo, which is a kind of mm -hmm. a Japanese storytelling, which is all about simplicity. And I thought it ironic that I love Japan uh, for its lessons in simplicity. And then this, you know, thing called PowerPoint had been invented and suddenly everyone just you know, because we're also a I mean, a vertical society, you know, the Hofstede's yeah. dimension. So let's, um, oh, and high uncertainty avoidance, one of Hofstede's mm -hmm. things. So let's just put as much stuff, you know, nen no tamini, just in case, <laughs> put everything, put the yeah. kitchen sink, put everything. And then, uh, I'm kind of jumping all over the place, but when I'd worked for Apple and I'd never had to present to Steve Jobs, but, uh, you know, people I worked with did. And I knew very well, if you ever had to present, you do not go in with slides uh, oh, really? or even with a very, yeah. Oh, absolutely not. Uh, or even a very complicated uh, story. You need to like, if it was an app, it's like, well, what does it do? Yeah. Um, and there were, I heard stories where often you'd say, I, I'm, I'm still not getting it, which is a kind of genius in itself to have the, yeah. the courage to say, I mean, I guess I if you're a billionaire it. and you, you know, you created this great company, you can say, I'm not getting this, but that's on you, yeah. not on yeah. me. So yeah. that's actually a very powerful lesson, although he didn't teach it to me directly, but the courage to say, I don't understand. Uh -huh. um, and so he would often say that, but in sort of a very intimidating way. Mm -hmm. um, but what he, I heard from my boss is that you got to get it down, crystallize it down to that, that nugget, which is often what storytelling is about. 
And then if you've got the interest of this person, in this case, Steve Jobs, but it could be anyone, then you can unpack it as they're asking questions. That's sort of the same idea when you go to pitch for VC, mm -hmm. you know, like in the Silicon Valley, is it not 20 slides of all this great stuff you're gonna do, which you can't see the future anyway, but mm -hmm. really drill it down to its nugget, to where you want those venture capitalists to interrupt you. Like, mm, oh, mm -hmm. well, wait a minute, let's go. And then go with that. Now you've got them. You, that's the whole point is to make them care. And then at least when it's pitching, man, it's great if they're asking the questions. Um, but always in Japan, almost always, it's just let me make, let me put an hour worth of material in 20 minutes and just ram it home. And for some, sometimes that works because the expectation among um, often, mm, I think, right. the well, older that guys, and well. is like I, they might think they're not going to admit this, but okay, I'm not understanding, but this seems really difficult. So you've done your <laughs> due your due diligence. I can see it because I have no idea what's going up there with these slides, but you have really worked. And then I'll let one of the younger people handle it. But again, that's sort of an emotional thing too. So mm -hmm. if you're too, this is a case of Japan. Mm -hmm. If you're too slick if you're really too like polished of a communicator um it, it depends on the situation but if you're too slick and then your visuals are too simple uh, well i don't think they're too simple but this person sitting there is like well wait a minute anyone could have just put that simple chart there mm -hmm. i want to see that you've really really worked hard so in that case you just have to know your audience and yeah. uh in that case you still try to simplify as much as you can uh, let's say your slides might be quite simple and really mm -hmm. targeted, but maybe you put just reams of everything in the handout, which is also sitting there. So if Mr. Tanaka says, well, what about, you know, 90, 90, oh, that's an excellent question. And that's on page 45. So let's right. take a look at that rather I than just. That. That's like the idea of you can separate what, you know, that almost you have, you know, these, these kind of to to um two tools in a way so you have like your your screen which you can keep simple but then that kind of gambarimashita look i did my due diligence i you know did a good job you can put that in a handout which you know i found that yeah. so funny mm. that that's really like that the japanese love to have things in their hands even if mm. it's the slides that are on the screen they're happy have you found that it's so strange yeah no that that's absolutely <laughs> true so and therefore i don't like that i you know i don't like the idea of iseki nicho you know because you feel <laughs> no actually so yeah they can be different things There's, it's very normal these days for them to be the same thing so you know eight lines of text or maybe 20 lines of text mm -hmm. and then i've got the same thing here which is easy to do but yeah i'd rather and in fact you could just get you know throw slides away no slides at all everything could just be the document right and i think i think it's actually that's what i advocate more and more whether mm -hmm. it's pitching or just coming in to share your idea have a really great visual, you know, maybe nicely printed up, easy mm -hmm. to navigate that you can take people through. But then I think you should stand up when you do this. You should have a whiteboard because you can fake, you know, slides. Even if you didn't oh, make yeah. the slides, it could be, well, as you can see, I don't know what this is, but I, but if you're really explaining something, you can, again, there's the handout for the takeaway and for more detail, but I can get up and it'll pop, pop open the pen and it's like this. And that's something that Apple, and I know in Steve's office, of course, everywhere, even my office at Apple was 100% whiteboard. The material on the walls was whiteboard, everything. Mm -hmm. People were always sketching things, even though it was, you know, a, a lot of computers there and tech, obviously, but people explain their ideas using whiteboards. That's a much better way. So I, you know, it, every, it's always case by case, but if it's mm -hmm. just, you know, a few people in a room, even 10 executives in a room, I would give them a handout and then go in there and uh, when it's my turn, I would stand up because I think that's respectful and also gives yeah. you, you know, some, it's just lazy to, to sit down unless they insist mm -hmm. on sitting down, then mm -hmm. of course you can sit down, but uh, just stand up and go to the whiteboard and um, tell us your story. What is this, this product or this new idea that you have? Mm -hmm. I love that. So Guy, you wrote one of your, or the first book that I read of yours, Presentation Zen. You actually published it on my mm -hmm. birthday, December 17th. Uh, which is why I remember. <laughs> oh, really? Um, yes. Yeah. 2000, 2007. Was, yeah, 2007. Yeah. yeah. So, um, presentations and you launched in or you published in, in at the end of 2007. We're now 2020. A lot's happened in yeah. in that time, especially right now, right? You know, where um, you know streaming live uh, from each other's uh, offices. Um, and this, you know, was kind of unthinkable in in 2007. So, I would love to know. 
what's changed since you originally wrote Presentation Zen, yeah. um, which if you haven't read the book or don't have it, go and get yeah. it. Gar didn't pay me to say that. You just, I'm just no, indeed. No. <laughs> um, what's changed? Uh, what's still true? Yeah, tell us. Yeah, well, you know, I, I wrote it so that it would it would be evergreen. I mean, there's, there is a third edition. Which I'll hold us here. A third edition. We oh, see it nice. So simple. It doesn't even say third edition. It's just three. Yeah. You got to be simple. And you know, it's mostly the same. The visuals, you know, the visual examples have changed mm -hmm. and things are updated and refreshed. But it's basically uh, the same book. Uh, the Japanese version is now or translating now, so it'll be out. Uh, I guess early next year. Mm -hmm. So what has happened? This this came out. This third edition was finished about nine months ago. So before Corona, if if I was to write it now, obviously I'd have a whole chapter, or well, at least four. several that's sections. That's presentation on, in four. <laughs> yeah, but again, the principles are the same. And, and always, mm -hmm. the, my idea was that these are the principles. How you apply it, it's always case by case, which is a very Japanese expression. Ah, so it's case by so case, case, case by case. By case. We even use that in katakana, case by case de which is toki to bai ni yote. But I mean, anyway, people know what you mean case by case because it, okay. it depends. But the principles are the same of restraint mm -hmm. and, and where you take time to really think in the preparation stage what's important and what's not and cut what you don't need. A simplicity in design, uh, which isn't easy. It's actually, that's hard. And so like, mm -hmm. rethinking what does simplicity mean? Simple doesn't mean uh, easy, just like an, you know, a smartphone. Smartphone is very simple for us, but very complicated, obviously, for the creator. And then a naturalness in delivery. So what I would, you know, okay, so what? Okay, what about the online world? Because we're presenting online so much. And if you would have asked me a year ago, and I've done, oh, I've done webinars, and I stopped doing them. I hated them because the bandwidth could never keep up. And the way I like to present is like how you would present live. Mm -hmm. So. You know, you know, so I would have words here and, and you can't do that or you couldn't do that. And now we have better software like OBS and it's not even just the software. Zoom is OK. It's the mm -hmm. bandwidth and you've got to have a direct connection. Usually Wi-Fi isn't even going to do it. You got to have it, you know, connect your Ethernet to your computer to get uh, you got to have the speed there. And then, but then there's on the other side, for example, with my students, if they have sort of lame Internet, then they're not mm -hmm. going to get a great visual experience. So you know, that gets back to, well, just keep things simple. Um, so one of the techniques, for example, we're using Zoom now, mm -hmm. and you can, um, you know, getting a green screen, it's like 5,000 yen, get a good green screen, and then you can be inside the slides. There's a different mm -hmm. way to do that, but it doesn't, I don't, it doesn't take as much bandwidth to do that. And then you're like the TV weatherman, so these slides can change behind me. And then you, and then, you know, people are looking at you on the screen, you right. and the visual, rather than just a slide, even if it's a beautiful slide, a great slide, a simple mm -hmm. graph, which is easy to understand. And then you're this little head and you're usually looking a different direction anyway. So um, what I would teach or what I do teach is um, you know, how to be more engaging. For example, not most people are still presenting, you know, they're like, Hi. <laughs> good to be on this. You know, so little thing, again, it's a lot of things. It's like how to make good film or a good mm -hmm. video. It's, you know, there's like 10 things. If you did these 10 things, they would be instantly much better, like getting a good microphone, getting a light, um, mm -hmm. you know, make, making sure the camera is around eye height. So, uh, so what were we talking about? We were oh, talking a presentation about that? You were, yeah, yeah, we were talking about that. We were talking about if there's anything that like has changed since you launched in 2007. And you said, un not unfortunately, but um, oh. just time-wise you launched or you, the, the third edition was um, before Corona. And we were talking yeah. about that maybe if it was after Corona that you would have had a whole nother chapter on visual storytelling, which yeah. is interesting because yeah. I've heard a lot about the student experience, right? And during this like Corona time, but maybe you want to talk a little bit about like the teacher experience. No, yeah, I just sort of had this epiphany. I mean, I my my instinct is to not like it because I love, you know, face to face. That's the whole point is it should be natural. Mm -hmm. That's one of the third, you know, pillars, the principles, naturalness. But I have to say from a instructor's point of view, I'm beginning to like it because I have such control. As long as I have the bandwidth, I wasn't liking it last semester because like an idiot, I was using my Wi-Fi, which is good Wi-Fi, but not nearly as fast as just getting a cable <laughs> and connecting it. And so now I've got a fast internet. And, you know, what I would do in a lot of classes, uh, even a marketing class, let's say, and then we're, you know, we watch videos, probably every class, at least a short video. Mm -hmm. And well, we can watch that 
now we can watch that together in Zoom at, at full yeah. full frame. Sound is good, video is good. I, I see all the students because of you know big screen. All the students they keep their monitors on it or their cameras on. They don't have to. I say it's okay mm -hmm. if you want to turn it off when we're watching the movie, but they keep it on. And I can tell from you know like if it's a Seth Godin thing and there's some jokes inside this TED talk and they're laughing at the right moment. So yeah. we do have this sort of engagement. But I can just control things and then I ask the students to annotate so they can go into Zoom. I might have a slide up and I go, go ahead, you know, write your comments down. They're anonymous because, you know, in Japan, people are hesitate. So, uh, so if you do things like, well, it's anonymous. So just go ahead and write whatever. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter if you misspell it because it's very fast. So they'll go ahead and annotate right over a TED talk or, or you know, I'll stop the video or something and they'll annotate right over it. I might say, OK, I'm going to go away. I'll play guitar for like two minutes. They'll hear that. In the background. <laughs> then I'll come back. You know, I play like the Jeopardy theme or something. Do, 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 do. <laughs> So you can, so there is some sense of control in a, in a good way. I mean, I'm trying to provide mm -hmm. a good product for the students. Sure. It, I'm finding it difficult to really get students to have a discussion. You so, know, the, I mean, yeah. you, that's true even in real life. So even mm -hmm. in live face to face, uh -huh. but you do think like you do breakout sessions, right? That's so true. I mean, you do training in Japan. So if there's a hundred people yeah. in your training, that's easy. They're at tables. So there's five or six yes. at a table and they do it at a table. So I, I'm like a painful extrovert. I'm not only just extroverted, like I am extroverted amongst extroverts. And so it's been interesting, um, this kind of like new experience, but I've um, really learned and collaborated with a lot of um, kind of my older, much older Japanese co colleagues or, or people that I know, you know, um, early 60s even, and I'm talking to them and I'm saying, how is it for you? And they have so many interesting insights about how to engage and how to, how to talk to people. And so for example, Instead of saying, you, you know, how is everybody? They say, you know, go and put in the chat your, your, the emoji that, you know, describes your latest, mm -hmm. like your, your newest emotion or, or what's the last thing you ate or things like that. And he, um, another, w w the colleague that I'm referring to also mentioned something quite funny. He said, you know, in Japan, if you ask everyone, if you ask someone who's got a question and you say, Dozo, you know, it's like nobody says anything. <laughs> Whereas like in the West, if we're on a, like, if we're like on an online discussion, we go, who's got a point, you know, it's like everyone, you know, unhooks their mic and starts talking. But at the end of the day, we, we don't have, you know, communication either way. Um, so I found it uh, very interesting. But again, as you said, there's a lot that was true, not only, you know, in our, in our offline world, as well as our online world. Um, another thing that I found super interesting about storytelling is that I've always known it kind of in terms of a, in terms of um, marketing and also certainly for pr um, presentation and certainly in the academic world, um, well, not certainly, actually it was kind of more through you. I know that not everyone had been, was not taught by you, so they didn't know that was normal. Um, you know, but we're seeing now storytelling being, being built as a core principle, not only a core principle, but a, a core competency um, in, in many consultancies and also businesses that they want to like raise their employees with this ability to, to tell a story. Can you tell us about the, maybe the relationship or what the, you know, is kind of what the businesses might be thinking about, you know, this push behind storytelling in a business context? Well, yeah, I mean, again, this it really, it's nothing new. I know it seems like it's new and a lot of books are written about it, but I mean, that's what marketing is, is it should be, it shouldn't be, we, it's not advertising. That's a very small part of it, which is very push and it's, it's one way. And also it's the idea that marketing is not just for the marketing department. And some companies might not even have marketing departments, but it's everyone's responsibility. And you, you see some CEOs are like that. I mean, Schultz, I'll just use big names because that's all I can think of this early in the morning for me. Uh, and then we're, so obviously like, like uh, Schultz at, at Starbucks was a story. I mean, they sell a commodity coffee, but you know, Steve at, at Apple, who was a great marketer, but he looked at it as, you know, it should be everyone's job. I was a little shocked because we get these MBAs coming from, you know, Harvard and Stanford and they weren't necessarily um, Apple. They didn't know the Apple history and they didn't really know the brand. They just, yeah, I mean, there's great to get a high paying, cool job, you know, at Apple or Google or whatever. But I think it's important that every employee knows, you know, that there's, there's the history of the company. It's, you know, origin story. You need to know the origin story of the company, but also what the company stands for. What is the why? And so in that sense, it's not, it's not just, you know, the, the domain of the marketing department to push things out, but every employee, every employee that interacts um, with the customer should know that it doesn't mean <laughs> it's storytelling doesn't mean, Oh, here, dear customer, you got five minutes. I want to tell you, I want to sell you something. It's not, it's not 
you know, it's not evangelism in that sense. Mm -hmm. It's just that you live whatever the brand promise is. And this is the problem with some companies. I think Nordstrom in the States is a company that does a good job at this. I haven't been in the States a long time, but a lot of companies that like say retail companies, they might have great product, but then they don't train the people who actually interact with the customer very well, mm -hmm. or they don't pay them well or something like that. And so of course that the brand story is all great right down until it gets to the customer <laughs> that, that it dies, right? Because they didn't invest uh, in, in that person. Uh, in Japan, that's, you know, it's, it's, that's not so much a problem because customer service is like, I think it was invented here, at least in yeah. some industries, maybe yeah, not in absolutely. banking, but in some yeah, industries. Yeah, no, absolutely. And also we see in the Japanese context that, um, that there's not this, you know, you don't join a company as a marketer and stay a marketer. You know, often you join a company and you begin in one role and then even with their Shin Yushayin program, you go through the company. So, you know, you, you're, you're educated really on, on what the company is. Um, so that kind of who we are that, you know, even how they introduce themselves, Toyota no Tanaka des, you know, they're like, I hmm. am the Toyota's Tanaka, you know, so they, yeah. they embody it. But at the same time, when it yeah. does come to that, a compelling story, we don't think of the Japanese. When we think of beautiful design, we think of the Japanese, but when it comes to a compelling story, we don't think of the Japanese. Well, yeah, like I said, I think that's ironic because of course there's yeah, been great yeah. film, filmmakers from Japan. I mean, the most famous one in the Western world was Kurosawa Akira, but th there are many others. Japan, it's gr great, great novels, great storytellers, uh, a, a you know, rich, coming. deep history yeah. in the Zen arts, which even you could argue things like Sumie and Ikebana are a kind of storytelling. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly Sumie through through visuals mm -hmm. that tells a story. Actually, I took a picture. I know it sounds so Instagram-ish, but I took a picture of... Uh, <laughs> pizza we we're at this really cool pizza place up there up on our mountain and uh which but it showed you know it, it mostly been eaten there were only two slices left of this organic pizza i got this real good bouquet and all that and but my wife said well that's a story you see because yeah. it's been consumed that's the story is it's by the way um story is everywhere it's a, it's sort of like the air we breathe i mean you can't deny it that's for, for better or worse that's the human condition mm -hmm. we see patterns everywhere so we, uh, we want to make stories and before we could read or write long before we could read or write we were educating we homo, homo sapiens that is we're educating people through story mm -hmm. you know don't go down by the river at this time because of alligators or whatever it's through story because you remember stories if you just tell steve or johnny or whatever people were named a thousand uh, hundred thousand years ago i don't know what their names were but you you know if you say don't go to the river at this time or whatever you know that doesn't register but if you tell the story of this boy mm -hmm. who was eaten by an alligator you know, that has that setup and the, the clear conflict, you know, and the resolution. And, the, you know, there's a there's a lesson in there. Uh, it's just more memorable. It helps people pay attention and it helps them to remember. So there, there's narrative structure, but also there's just, you know, the anecdotes and the examples. If we're talking about teaching or even mm -hmm. if you're out just doing a training or you're selling your product information doesn't register with people but people remember stories so i don't mind sometimes students complain i hear them not in my about my classes or here in <laughs> japan but i mean like in the states oh, oh this professor he would often tell stories about i just want to hear the chemistry and i don't want to hear his life story about chemistry like no, that's what i want because i at least me i can get I can get all the information I need about whatever, say physics, you know, 201, second year physics. I can get that in a book. I can get mm -hmm. the same book that Harvard students have. I actually want those kind of relevant stories mm -hmm. and maybe sometimes not even relevant stories, but I want, you know, that's what really adds the, the color to something like a, you know, a, a class, not just lecture notes. You know, we're talking about that stories are um, ways that we can teach people. And, you know, you're talking about, you know, for example, this physics professor, the reason why you you actually, you know, one person is saying, just give me what I need to know for the exam and I'm done. And yeah. you're saying, no, actually, I want to know what this guy's, yeah. you know, um, what this person's um, views. I want to know what happened to them in their life. But even mm -hmm. before we get them, uh, before we get to that point where we where we can engage in story, we kind of have to do what you mentioned at the beginning. I'd love if you can talk a bit more about it, which is that we need to encourage someone to care. We need someone's attention for them to even be be around for us to to tell them a story. How how would you you know with with so many things that have been changing, um, and you know if we think about that, there's a million um, messages coming to us at every any one moment. Um, 
how do you think that we might be able to tactically encourage, you know, encourage someone to care or develop that empathy, that connection with them to care so we can, so we can get their attention, get them to care so we can tell them a story? Yeah, I think uh, I can't remember names now because nouns go away. But anyway, there was this famous guy who I think he called it uh, W-I, what's in it? W-I-F-T, what's in it for them? This is like, you know, presentation 101 is that right at the beginning, you have to, um, to get them to care, you have to let them know what's in it for them. Or in other words, the why, why is this important? You know, why, why you should care, why you should listen to this. And even if it was something, you know, like a, um, it could be any kind of class, history, Japanese history class, let's say, that, you know, students have to take different requirements that they might not want to take, but they're in this Japanese history class. And why is this important? You know, why do I care? Why am I passionate about this? I mean, that's part of it. This is why I'm passionate about X, Y, Z. But this is why other people uh, are, are now passionate about it. And you could also tell stories of there were people, maybe you in the audience think, I don't need this. I don't care about this. And tell stories of those kinds of people who, who changed, you know, because of this class or because they studied this mm -hmm. subject. So I often, I mean, to get people to care, I often tell stories uh, of my wife because she's now, you know, basically native speaker. I mean, she tests out as native speaker, but when she was 19 or 20, she was very, you know, normal, you know, mama when it comes to English. So I tell that story to give students, even though I'm not an English teacher, but they might, you know, they might lack the confidence because these classes are done in English or the trainings in English. And that gives them confidence to see, well, here's a woman who's now, you know, you know, an executive job, not just because of English, but that was a necessary condition to be an executive in this industry in Japan. And it can just open doors and all this. So I tell those stories to try to inspire students to, to want to care. Of course, you can't make anybody. That's the thing about education. You can't blame, you know, the teachers 100% or even close to that for the uh, students failing. I mean, mm -hmm. you have to, you have to make an effort. And, you know, i when I was a student, I, I tried to make an effort. I, my freshman year was not good, but then I uh, learned from senpai things like, you know, move to the near front of the class, even though I'm more of an introvert. Mm. That really helped. Just go to the front of the class, kind of be involved. I didn't ask a lot of questions, but anyway, just even moving, little things like that. And going to class too. I used to skip class because uh, I, you know, why not? Uh, but then just like never missing class, sitting in the front, these kinds of things, making an effort um, even if I had a bad teacher and, you, and the thing is good students, students who care, they survive bad teachers, right? They yeah. do because they want to learn. They want to persevere. But mm -hmm. our job as educators or trainers is to try to make that as inviting as possible to, mm -hmm. to really invite students in. But you never get 100% of anything, whether you write a book, you're not going to get a, you get 100% five stars. You know, you want five stars and you want one stars, right? Right, you because that means you, you don't want an average of three. You might want an average of three would be great if you had a lot of fives and a lot of ones. Yeah, and then and but if ones. It, but if you have a lot of threes, it's like, well, who wants that? So we should make an <laughs> effort. I, I might be going all over the shop, but because you want your, you know, you, well, we need to do what we can to make our classes inviting. But and you if, can't, you can't get everybody, even though we try as hard as we can. And when you're talking about, you know, that getting people, that getting them to care, that um, th that initial connection, that human connection, that often begins with um, something that often we, we can't even really have a lot of control over, which is that trust element. How do I, you know, do I trust you? Have you, is there, you know, do you look trustworthy? Um, and so if we thought about the role of trust um, in, in storytelling, what, what's the significance of building trust in, in storytelling? And is there anything that we can do to change it? Or to well, I mean, I, I don't know. You, you, you didn't give me this question, so I hadn't have time, time to think about it. That's a very <laughs> no, but like deep building, philosophical. Building trust. <laughs> but I mean, I mean, and, and we were talking about Japan. So as you know, trust mm -hmm. is, is much more long term. It takes time uh, to, to build that. So there are cosmetic things you do, such as just mm -hmm. being as professional, overly professional. Whereas, you know, in the States, I would, I mean, at Apple, I, I would always dress in jeans and a t-shirt. And, and if it, it depends, if it was a tech industry that I'm presenting at, of course, I would dress like that. But then other size, other ways, dressing better than your audience, 
um, you know, being really um, strict with, you know, things like time and that kind of, mm -hmm. you know, professional stuff to build the trust, but also not in your stories, not uh, really kind of focusing on the positive rather than negative. And, you know, if you're Coca-Cola Japan, you don't say anything negative about Pepsi. You know, that's, it's cliche. Maybe this is to Japan 101. But uh, I, I see foreign, you know, say Australians or Americans come here and just with their story, they yeah, yeah, focus on the positive <laughs> just because it just, it's just more, it's a better impression since they don't know you, right? They might not understand that you're actually very trustable and a kind and diligent person. But if the first thing they hear are kind of negative stories about the mm -hmm. competition, uh, then that can leave a bad impression. Uh, but I don't know. The only thing about trust is that, um, you know, it, it takes a long time. I don't, but so that, that's, again, that's Japan 101. So I don't think you want to go there. No, and not necessarily like the, the, the 101 stuff, but coming from someone like, like you with your experience, and I personally love your Mitsubishi and Apple stories. Like I, 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 I love hearing, um, you know, what you experienced and also like how, how much some of it is, is still so relevant today. Um, but when it, when it does come, come to building trust in, in storytelling, there is so much um, about that. And I, I think it, maybe one thing that, that we can do is maybe not wait for the moment that we're telling the story to, to be that be like our 100% trust capital. One thing that mm -hmm. I like to do is to, is to create trust capital even before walking into a meeting. So for me, there's, there's things like either you're, you know, you have, you, for example, if someone was to Google you right now, Gar Reynolds, you know, one of the mm -hmm. first thing that comes up is that you have, you know, TED Talks with 200,000, you know, views of you talking about presentation. So if somebody said, what does he know about presentation? Well, there's mm -hmm. a trust asset right there and they haven't even connected with you. So one thing that we can do in this kind of digital age is to, is, is to leverage and create trust assets that don't require us to build trust in, in the moment. Because as you said, it takes a long time. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, that, that, that's always great. Right. So if you don't need a self introduction, you know, someone doesn't, or someone doesn't even have to introduce you with all these accolades because you know, your reputation comes before you. Um, but I, we want it to be real and authentic because there's a whole industry of people trying to fake it. You can fake Amazon reviews, for example, and other mm. reviews. And we want to keep it, we want it real and you know, that's like things like a TED talk. If you want to do a TED talk, that probably means you shouldn't do a TED talk. It's not supposed to be the motivation for it. You know, you want to be invited because they want, you know, they want to hear you. You have something to say rather than hmm, if I get a TED talk, then that will help my marketing. Yeah, <laughs> right. yeah, exactly. Right. Which then brings us to like that one of the points as well that, that you mentioned about that's, you know, synonymous with storytelling or should be synonymous with storytelling, which is that authenticity. And if we could also talk about a little bit the lens of, um, you know, even if we use, for example, Japan as an analogy for an introvert, not everybody kind of stands up and does that kind of like TED talk, like imagine mm -hmm. a world where blah, 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 you know, people, <laughs> yeah. you know, People's storytelling yeah, yeah. is, you know, is different. It doesn't have to be the same. Can you talk a little bit about how you can build that authenticity? Does it have anything to do with confidence? Is it, is it about knowing yourself? Yeah. What, what no, does that no, look like? You know, we don't, we don't all have to be like the extrovert uh, on stage. And in fact, most people are probably a little bit more reserved than that. And they, they don't want to put themselves out there. But they can, you know, even making videos for, for example, my students, they make these really professional presentation videos with the PIP picture in picture, kind of like the network news. But if, there are some students who are super shy. And I tell them, you know, if you don't want to be, you don't have to film yourself. So they, you hear their narration, but they're showing, uh, one of the great ones was uh, she was an animator. So she animated herself oh, wow. in, and it was her voice. So she recorded the narration of the presentation. Uh, it's a 10 minute presentation and then she mm -hmm. made the animation for it which is a ton of work but that's the thing she loves to do and and the narration was great so her her true self could really come out and it was this you know, it was great she had the connection but she's very shy to go in front of a camera and kind of show herself and you know i don't want to force people to do that so mm -hmm. she found a way there are other ways to do it um this is why in live presentations visuals can be uh use they shouldn't be used as a crutch where you disappear in the dark but for some people they, they can really add to the show and that takes some pressure because now you're looking and you're engaged with not reading i don't mean reading that but engage usually with a humorous way 
where this kind of shy person is telling their story through these visuals, many visuals. It's sort of, and, and he's there as well, but it, just, it takes a lot of pressure off uh, rather than just standing there. Uh, mm -hmm. Some people love that, but we have to remember, I didn't know you were so extroverted, but you have to remember that a lot of people are much shyer and, and in this country, uh, we don't, I don't know what it's like in Australia, but in the United States, kids grow up um, kind of forced to show and tell and you know, oh, do yeah. these kinds of talks in front of classes. And in Japan, we do it at elementary school. It's a little bit more, a little bit more of that. But in junior high, it's kind of stops. And mm -hmm. except for maybe, you know, burying your head in a piece of paper. So yeah, I, I, I think this is an opportunity. That's why video, I think online stuff is great because it, it offers an opportunity. Of course, there are people who have different disabilities who can't, it's a godsend because they, they can't get out of the house very yes. easily or as much. So, you know, I don't, I'm, you know, I'm not a, Lud a Luddite in that sense because that's video and other mm -hmm. apps are really wonderful. Uh, but then there are also people who are just shy or, or, or flourish in, through filmmaking or, or video making or, you know, or doing narration for their videos, for their travels, for their business, whatever. Uh, I have a friend who has a, maybe I should do a plug for her company. Should I do that? Should, sure, go for you it. should maybe interview her. She's called Kitchen Bamboo Princess. Oh, is this, the, and, this is your neighbor? Yeah, she's the, a yeah, YouTuber. Yeah, the YouTuber, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, some of her videos have been seen, you know, like how to make a Japanese breakfast has millions of hits and she's yes. uh, approaching 200,000 subscribers, but, uh, but millions of hits or, or views. And, and she wrote a book published this year on how to become a YouTube star in an authentic way. But uh, I told her or, or suggested to her, you got to show your, show your face and show a little bit of that. Uh, anyway, she became famous and very successful without ever showing her face. And now this year she's, she's changing that where she's in the thumbnails now and uh, not so much in the video. The video is just the camera showing the food. But for her, you know, that's her style and it's worked. It's still connected. She has, you know, a lot of fans all over the world mm -hmm. and without having to be out there with don't don't forget to like and subscribe, <laughs> you know, which gets to be annoying after a while. But yeah, that's we the world we're in. That it is. <laughs> and if we were to kind of um, also take that kind of same same uh, theme and then apply it to kind of a business context. I know that there's a lot of people that listen to this that are doing client presentations or they're doing, you know, presentations internally. Um, how do you recommend that, you know, if, if you if you have to stand up and give a presentation, what are some of those things? So you mentioned uh, visuals, but is there is there anything else? And maybe this is kind of more like the during the preparation, maybe it's the self-talk. Um, what what are the kind of things that you would recommend these these people to to do before they walk into their presentation? You know, because I'm I'm always interested in how might we be able to manage the expectations of our client or of our team, um, mm. but also to deliver still in an authentic way. Like maybe you're introverted, but you still have to give a presentation. Okay, you know, what are some of those things things that we can do? Right. If if you do have so you are talking about live presentation, so not not making a video, but for sure it's going to be live. Well, maybe, well, maybe if we're talking about a video, I guess, what, what would we do? Would we, we'd have to first somehow manage expectations around that. Would you, would you like write your boss in an email and be like, I'm going to do this presentation in a video or how would that look like? Oh yeah. I mean, I don't think unsolicited that really works. Here's a video I made about my idea. No, yeah. I mean, you know how it works in Japan. If it's just, there's the kind of nemawashi buildup yeah. for, so you do that kind of, whether it, it used to be through going out, but just in the company, whatever, mm -hmm. usually probably people under before you get to that level. But let's say you have made it to that level. So now, mm -hmm. okay, uh, the boss wants to hear your idea with mm -hmm. 10 other people. And in that case, well, you know, in that case, if the, if the sort of nemawashi has been done, you mm -hmm. know, the pre sort of building of, I don't want to say consensus, but just a little, little bit of buy-in, then I think you could do a video. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, the boss might appreciate a video um, mm. but you can't just say here's a video i made out of the blue but you i think you could I'm, by the way i'm thinking about this for the first time um but in a way that's more efficient in terms of time and getting people together and if and again it's not out of the blue he, he or she has said yep i want to see that and in fact mm -hmm. I, if i were a boss i would initiate that it's like give yeah. them a say you have a okay everybody i mean i think recruit does a lot of kind of cool stuff around this generating ideas Mm -hmm. And they have people work in groups and then they have some sort of presentation in Taikai in the company. 
but you could do it this way where, okay, you, you know, your team is going to make a professional video to mm -hmm. explain your idea and you don't need any special equipment. If you even have an old crappy iPhone seven, like me, that's professional, that's professional grade video. I mean, if you have a mirrorless or a DSL, that's great, but you don't need it mm -hmm. and you don't need anything but iMovie. Um, so you could what do that. I, what about expectation management for a second? So this is now like well, what up for me, like now we're talking about this boss thing. What about expectation management? So I'm obviously, you know, team simple slides, you know, I'm team, you know, t telling your story in a, in a compelling way. But at the same time, lots of us that are presenting to Japanese audiences, um, you know, we, they, there is that, there is that gap. Um, is there, is this kind of like a give and take thing? Like do, assume because well, you know it's almost like in a way we're assuming this is the right way we're assuming that you know presenting in this way is the right, you know is is the better way i think it's the better way mm. but is there a way that we can kind of as as professionals on, on the outside and it's not even if you're japanese or foreign it's just if, if you're presenting in a different way then you know what's kind of the standard if you want to encourage a yeah. more engaging a more interactive presentation experience is there little things that we can do along the way that might open the door to our audience being a little bit more open to this kind of new style of presentation? Well, I mean, again, like I said before, is you have to know your audience. And if it's mm -hmm. say banking industry, they're very, you know, set in their ways and they're used to very, you know, data intensive, well, data, just even text intensive, just mm -hmm. lots and lots and lots of information. So if you're doing something different, especially in a training situation, it's more like music. I mean, it's like Beethoven or something. Sometimes it's really beautiful and there's lots of empty mm -hmm. space, but other times it's just lots of stuff. So, mm -hmm. you know, just, just, have a variety so no one can say well you didn't hit me with a lot of data well, we had a lot of data but yeah. then the, you have to give meaning to the data and there are a lot of examples of people who present with lots of data like the the late great hans rosling who oh, did yes. these ted talks who had tons of data he even co-invented the software that gapminder but you can't say that's not a lot of that's a lot of visualization of data mm -hmm. um and yet you can also present it in a a very engaging way where he told stories, he used props, to, you know, to build things to show well, what he used you know, to run what, around and like follow the bubbles moving on the screen and everything. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he did that, you, you know, you don't, there's, you don't have to follow any textbook way of doing it. I think it's mm -hmm. more important to be authentic. But you do have to deal with this expectation that, um, you know, what I expect, you know, from senior people, often what they expect is just to be hit because they're so used mm -hmm. to it. And it's, mm -hmm. it shows again, as I said before, that you were diligent. So I, what I do to combat that, for lack of a better word, is just I know I know that's happening, but I also know the expectations. So I do very simple visuals that complement stories and things like that. Uh, but then and there's breakouts and then there's discussion and then I'll hit them. There's more. It, it, there was still really easy to understand slides, but there's mm -hmm. there's data in there where you have to go slower and explain that. Mm -hmm. and then do a handout with a lot more data so it does show still that you're serious you can't just do the whole thing where mm -hmm. you know it's just uh just images yeah no that yeah that that really resonates with me that that idea that it's you know you don't it's not about this like what like one shot of success what you want to do is you know you want to connect with people on on different levels as you said some people are looking for data others are looking for story others are looking for finance others are looking for you know from an advertising lens and so if we can if we can create a story like you said like you know almost mm. that we're creating music if we can find a way that each person might enjoy a part of the song or a part of the show that's probably where um, yeah. we, we might be more successful we but still very much managing those expectations while being authentic so that's for me yeah kind of yeah at the end of the day right? at the end of the day i mean it's you as a presenter uh, is is still what they're they're buying in a way i mean certainly this is true with with vc and if you ask any venture capitalist uh they will say i mean i've got a couple of friends like guy, guy kawasaki who used to do that um david rose is another one he's the pitch called the pitch coach out of new york but he would say at the end of the day what i'm investing is what i'm buying is you i'm investing in you you this woman this man and your ideas and so uh of course those other things are important whatever the details that this mm -hmm. client expects in, in deliverable but it's also how you present it and your true self your authentic self needs to come across and so it doesn't mean being perfect or slick and all these things because mm -hmm. people are suspicious of that i'm suspicious of that mm -hmm. <laughs> right um 
so um, again, you have to show that you've done your, your due diligence. And so, like I said before, you might have handout, might have just, wow, mm -hmm. I can see through the handout that you have, but the actual live talk is much more engaging through questions and discussion and maybe simple, uh, well, well designed visuals. Um, and so they, it, it sounds cliche to have, well, they have to have a good impression of you, but they do invest in you or believe you, you as yeah. a person, you, Brittany, must be yeah. what they Yeah, are. no, that's true, though. And, you know, and people, and as much as, um, you know, this is true in Silicon Valley, this is equally tr true in Japan, there, there is this, you know, innate, you know, oh, well, if blah, blah said it, if Tanaka-san said it, I've done business with Tanaka-san for 20 years, then, mm -hmm. all right, just go ahead and do it. So there is certainly this, uh, the human element or that personal element is, is still very much, um, I would say, true oh. in Japan as well. Yeah, absolutely. Even though, and I hate to quote Steve Jobs all the time, it's just the <laughs> CEO I know the best. And he, and, and Guy would talk, use this word too, but he's, the guy's pretty, Guy Kawasaki, actually, he's very nice. Uh, he's very nice with people. Uh, but anyway, Steve Jobs used to, and I think a lot of people are like this, a lot of CEOs, you're either a bozo or you're, or you're not. And he's always, and you are a bozo until you prove otherwise. That was his default. Right. And I, I don't know, that's not my default. But in a way, we're all kind of doing that. Mm -hmm. I think even in Japan, we wouldn't say bozo, but are you trustable? Are you in? Uh, are, you know, do I want to let you into the in-group eventually because you're mm -hmm. a trustable um, what, vendor or whatever it is? Yeah. Um, but, so, but even at that level, you know, even if we, I mean, who can be the highest level? We'd say going into a meeting with Steve Jobs, he's going to buy your company for 500 billion, not million, 500 million, let's say. Yeah. Okay, right? Yeah. He doesn't want to see spreadsheets and all this stuff because they've, they've got that anyway. So yeah, he's looking the through the, the day, bozo filter. Are you bozo or not a bozo? And so they're a little, I've heard this, they ask, I don't know if this is true, but they, he would ask really weird questions just to see if you're going to go with like a bullshit question. And he's, are you going to give a bullshit answer? Or are you going to say, that's a, that's a weird question. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's true. There's another thing that I've um, kind of noticed, and I'd love your, your opinion on this uh, in Japan, is that I've often found full spreadsheets or crazy slides um, actually founded in fear. Fear of either my job or my boss's reputation or whoever, but there's a lot of fear driving the conversation. And when we allow fear to drive a conversation, it comes out. So when we go to our client and we present these slides that have been built with PowerPoint and fear together yeah. equally, you know, and we say, yeah. this is, this is the slide. Um, the, the client is looking at it and sure they might say, yeah, you know, you've done your due diligence, but at the same time, maybe they're thinking, oh my God, I don't get this. And, and they wouldn't say that. Right. You know, and they think, I don't get it. So you're, you know, you want to make your client feel connected. You want to, you know, you want to, you want them to trust you. You want that connection. You want that humanness that exists between you when you tell a story. But if you're driving that with like fear-based you know, data and, and slides, that's, that's gotta be it. And I'll just yeah. call that it. Yeah. I mean, I think, you, you know, you want your, you want your clients or your students to feel smart, just like you choose yes. your friends. I don't mean to lie or to deceive you like a parent might yeah. <laughs> You're the best singer ever, <laughs> uh, but you want, you know, you want someone to make you feel better than just being by yourself. Mm -hmm. And what goes with students, it goes with in business too, is that, you know, you, I, I understand what you're saying and I, you know, and I, I appreciate that. And no one likes being felt, you know, oh, I feel stupid. I should know this, but I don't understand. Mm -hmm. And then, like I said before, kind of circling around, having the courage to say, I, I don't get it. I don't understand. Once more. And mm -hmm. uh, that's on us as communicators. Yeah. I don't think you can be too simple. I don't mean dumb it down, not in an no. insulting way, yeah. but um, uh there's been some research on this, but I, I just anecdotally, I remember when I was in Australia, interviewed on ABC and uh, an announcer who's actually was from England, but he had said he'd been to a lot of medical conferences and the doctors, and he's not, a, he was not a doctor, but he understood some of the talks and the talks he understood by medical doc, by doctors were, um, you know, those that were, had story and were engaging and all this. He understood those. And then he asked the other doctors, which presentations did you like the best? And they always said it was those presentations too. And my, doc, my friends who are doctors and surgeons in UK, for example, they go to a lot of boring conferences and there's a movement mm -hmm. there for storytelling, for simple, simple display 
you know, a cleaner display of visual information mm -hmm. rather than just hitting people with reams and reams of information. It's also in that book, um, the book by Chip and Dan Heath. The book is called Made to Stick, which is a New York Times bestseller and still selling well all these years ago. Um, they did some, I don't know if it was a scientific study, but it was, at least it was some sort of study at Stanford that the students who told the best, rated the best presentations were those students who used stories and anecdotes inside their uh, presentations. And if, um, but if we think about the industries that need, that are most in the driver's seat to change our lives and our society and our world, it's things like health, it's things like finance, you know, and so we want our doctors and we want our, our, you know, our, the people that are managing money, we want them sitting in conferences and understanding actually what's going on, right? That's actually a little bit scary. Yeah. We don't just need marketers telling yeah. great stories, we need everyone telling great stories. I think so. I was brought in, I shouldn't say the name of the company because some people might hate me and it, but it's a very big finance company in, in based in New York City. <laughs> anyway, I was there to talk to their, um, to 300 of their, uh, Mm -hmm. what do you call them i don't know anyway young kind of analysts. Uh, analysts yeah and i did all day and including with the exec team which were the number you know number two on down people in the company and you would be surprised if i said the name of the company but mm -hmm. they because it's, it's a completely data-driven huge company a financial company and yet they think they said we need better storytelling we need to uh, we need our analysts to yes they're great at the numbers they all come from the ivy league schools and all that stuff mm -hmm. but they are they, they, that's not what customers want. And, you know, customers could, could be multi-billionaires even, but they, they, cause they're busy. So mm -hmm. give me the essence. And that essence is usually uh, a very simple, short story, not a, you know, not fiction. It's a, tr a true story. Yeah. In a sense, but We're not lying. What's the, what's the problem, right? What's the conflict and, and what's the resolution or what's our idea uh, to solve that problem? It's, I mean, it's elementary but so many presentations don't even have that nugget. I mean, it's almost over. I still don't know what the conflict is and your ideas are all over the shop. So, you know. If we had someone that was giving a presentation either tomorrow or, or next week, um, what are some of the things that, that we will, should leave them with um, that they can immediately uh, implement in, in just telling a better story in the next presentation? Yeah, I mean, if you know when when is it? Let's say you have seven days, and the first thing is the, the preparation preparation stage, which you, you have to uh, first you know know your audience or so research their expectations and and their background, and then you know what is it you want to say, you know what, what's the I, I often say the elevator pitch, but let's say you have a twenty minute you have twenty minutes with them, but imagine what if you only had one minute with them what would you say so start there get it really right down to your essence this is what i want to say this is my not even a one minute like in, when you make a movie like in hollywood or any any movie there's uh there's the log line which is what's the one sentence this movie is what in one sentence of course it's mm -hmm. bigger than that but you got to be able to get it down whether it's a product or just your idea what's your idea here's my idea or here's what i'm pitching in one sentence or two uh, and then build it out to a short one minute presentation. And then you can do the, the 20 minutes, maybe three, three major things you want to hammer inside this, this talk, but, you know, keep it at the essence. And if you have 20 minutes, you don't have to talk for 20 minutes, right? Mm -hmm. you can, I mean, that's where you try to get them into discussing as people don't want to just listen for 20 minutes. Rarely has that happened. I mean, you want them, as I said before, you, you hope they interrupt mm -hmm. with questions. Absolutely. And if I were to, I have to be very respectful uh, of your time, um, but I have a thousand more questions. But if I were yeah. to ask you one question oh, yeah. that is constantly being fired at, at me, uh, you know, training in Japan and presenting in Japan, and now I would love your view on this, is humor in Japan, yes or no? Oh, yes. Joke, yes or no? Well, not, you know, not Joe, you know, like... <laughs> You know, like this guy walked into a bar. That doesn't work. There's, there's culture and there's cultural stuff. So yeah. uh, even though I usually I present, and when I, you know, usually I present in English almost always. Um, and it's just, a, you know, I go to the Kokuditsu Daigaku and the international mm -hmm. companies, the multinational companies. So English is okay there. Um, but y yes, if it's that, if that's natural to you, um, mm -hmm. again, not humor at anyone's expense, unless oh, it's yourself, no. your your own expense, fine. 
you know, when I was like in New Zealand, I did some, I won't say who was president then, this is a while ago, and there was a video that was pretty funny and it, it illustrated my point. And of course, it's New Zealand, so they, they really laughed at this. But there was one person later who told me, that I didn't think it was respectful for that person. Oh, uh, so, you know, you always run, in, you always run into that. So it, it was quasi, since it dealt with a president, even though it wasn't a political video at all, it wasn't political in any way, but because it features a political person. So anyway, yes, if humor is natural to you, but it's the kind of humor that, um, like a juxtaposition, mm -hmm. uh, iron, irony is okay. I think it, it does work in Japan. Japanese love humor. I mean, manzai is big. There's all sorts of, like I said, rakugo, which is storytelling. So yes, you can do humor, but not, not jokes. And if you've been in Japan, you know kind of what Japanese think is, what Japanese think is funny. Basically, if it's any, if it's self-deprecating, it's, should be fine yeah or any kind if of it's like natural food to reference you. and any kind of food sorry some, oh like yeah food reference as well so it's like for some reason some like somehow very funny i don't know yeah i mean i did some used to i won't even say online because now it seems a little bit sexist but it was so normal back in the day to make this kind of joke it wasn't derogatory against women it was just well it's just a little bit uh, little, a little bit dark, um, a little bit sexual, let's say, but it was completely mm -hmm. appropriate in the nineties. And I used to, and it would get a huge, it would get a huge laugh on stage even 10 years ago. And mm -hmm. I stopped saying it just cause I think it just, and it would still be funny today. Mm -hmm. I don't think anyone would be offended, but I come to realize that, yeah, that's kind of, you know, we shouldn't normalize this kind of thing, which yeah. anyway, uh, so th things do change, but I gave you a very long answer to yes, yes. Humor. Of course people are emotional. And there's no, I mean, look, if it's a funeral, that's a whole different thing. So maybe not there. <laughs> but even then, <laughs> I think that would be, look, it just depends on the situation. If that yeah. if that person would appreciate that kind of. Or not. Because I, yeah, because you often do see jokes, not jokes, okay. you know, not Jordan, so that, that doesn't work. But um, I, irony and just kind of talk, sharing your own story through visual, like maybe a funny picture that's relevant of your childhood or something like that, those, those kind of visual things or ironic, I'm trying to think, I can't think of an example offhand, but let's just say I would, you could do something like, uh, I am a very, I'm really good at cleaning my office. As you can see, I have a very clean office and you click, right? And it shows your office, which is like the messiest office in the world. Uh -huh. Okay, that's not exactly a high level of humor, but it, that would get a laugh, right? Because it's it's obvious that you're being and, sarcastic. And also another one of your killer jokes is like when you say, okay, and imagine a boring presentation and then you say, hopefully not this one. And everyone goes, ha ha ha, that kills every time in Japan. Like when I've seen yeah. the videos. <laughs> yeah, that kind of thing. Or, and then giving a, a joke, you know, uh -huh. you say something and then people laugh, but maybe not great. And then you can say under your breath, you can just say, that was a joke. Nice. No, it's almost... <laughs> And then that gets a laugh. So um, again, as long as it's self-deprecating humor, again, you don't that want way. to beat yourself up, not not in a sad way, but mm -hmm. in a, that kind of way where it's obviously you're just kind of joking. But I would say never, yeah, never jokes. Of course, not about the prime minister or even your president or what. Just stay away from those kinds of things generally, mm -hmm. but anything about yourself. I love it. And Gar, where now that we're wrapping this up, where can we mm -hmm. find, where can people find you next? So obviously presentations, then volume three is coming out. People can look out for that. Where yeah. else can we best follow you? Uh, I'm on Twitter, I'm on <laughs> Facebook, I'm on Instagram. I don't use it so much. I should use it more. I don't know the future, but presentations then will be more active and Gar Reynolds will be more active. Um, but yeah. I, love I can it. be, and you can contact me through email there um, yes, in Japanese no. or, or English. Oh, de no that. So this, ne? That's true. Not to go master. Kill a joke. Though. Kill a joke. Yeah. That would work. Like That's that. not a joke. I'm a. Homani <laughs> But um, thank you so much. Honestly, um, the 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 lessons and the stories that that I had the honor and the pleasure of uh, listening to you. 12 years ago as a student um, have, have guided me uh, now um, through my professional life. And um, uh, and I'm sure this is really only the beginning. So thank you so much for the, the very, very important work that you do um, to that, you know, it's, it's something that we don't, that we don't really 
think about as being a core skill, but the ability to, to communicate authentically in a way to build trust has, has really just transformed the way that I've been able to build relationships. And so, you know, it, it's funny because it, it feels like in a way that the lessons that I learned, um, you know, in your classes have been with me every day. So thank you honestly so much for All right. the last 12 years and thank you for, thank you for your time today. Thank you. And we will see you again on the internets and hopefully someday in person in Tokyo.